Well, welcome everyone. And uh, I trust you all had a wonderful uh, birth of Christ celebration. And uh, I know we did and uh, always appreciate that time of year, even though it's technically not when Jesus was born, but it doesn't matter. You can celebrate at any time. And uh, that's how I view those celebrations, even though some of them have been were hijacked by the pagans. Um, but uh, doesn't matter. We celebrate the real thing according to what the Bible says. So um, today I'm uh, starting a new set of lessons. It's from a book that I wrote called Letters to the Seven. It's actually Letters to the Church is the name of the book and it's starts in revelation one nine through 20 although we'll briefly look at some other verses um the reason i wrote this uh was that i after looking at a lot of uh, commentaries i realized that nobody was really kind of treating this issue the way i wanted to i wanted to uh, a lot of people who write about the seven churches you know either write uh, about the actual seven churches, which is absolutely legitimate and uh, it's something that that needs to be done. Or they write about the sort of prophetic idea that uh, the seven churches represent uh, different stages of the church through history. And that's uh, that's also interesting, although it's not biblical, <laughs> but uh, it may well be true. It certainly does look like, they do represent the different times of the church in history and the development of the church. But I really uh, felt moved to write about the fact that when Jesus gave this revelation to John, that it started with the letters to the seven churches. And of course it, uh, it was for them, you know, it, it was messages for them and what they were about to go through. But you know what? It's a message for us, especially as the end time church. And we need to take the precepts out of that and apply it to our circumstances today. Because, because why? Because we're actually going to possibly at least see the beginning of the, the revelation come to pass. So it's important to know to whom revelation was written and for what purpose. And we look at uh, Re Revelation 1.1. It says, what will shortly take place? Now, we have to remember that shortly to the Lord is different than it is for us. And this is Jesus talking. A thousand years is as one day to the Lord. We know that from the Bible. Now, preterists try to use that verse to try to prove that everything in Revelation happened shortly after it was delivered to the churches in the first century. Well, the problem with this view is that Jesus hasn't returned bodily to rule and reign in his millennial kingdom. The saints have not been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The dead saints have not come back to life, except for those uh, who were raised during Jesus' resurrection, nor have several other prophecies been fulfilled yet. So the letters to the churches did prophesy things that happened in the first century, Still, the precepts that we find in them are also appropriate to the church throughout history, and especially to the last day's church, as it will see the final fulfillment of all the prophecies of Revelation. Revelation 1.11 says, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 19 says, Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. A key verse. John, first of all, saw it. In, other, in another sense, it's already seen. Prophecy is often written in the Old Testament as if it has already come to pass. It's a done deal. Uh, here's an example from Isaiah about that. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace 
was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. See, it's talking about that as if it already had happened. And it wasn't until Jesus came that that was fulfilled. So what is now? These letters, of course, were to the seven churches, actual first century churches. What will take place later? These letters are also to all churches and Christians through the ages, giving them precepts to live by. What will take place later? These letters alerted Christians about what would take place, not only at the time of the seven actual churches, but also at the time of the end, before the day of the Lord. Some of these prophecies were partially fulfilled in the time of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Some of them have a dual fulfillment in the last days, and some are yet to be fulfilled in the last days. Everything written in Revelation after this statement was a prophecy of things to come that are already set in heaven to the actual churches in Asia Minor and every other church and Christian since then. This includes the letters to the seven churches, not just the rest of Revelation. In fact, since this part comes first, it's really important. The letters include praise, exhortation, rebuke, warnings and blessings for the churches. They also include blessings and warnings for individual Christians. Now, why do I say that? Well, listen to how it's phrased. He who has an ear to ear uh, has an ear, let him let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is repeated seven times. Individual Christians are to hear what God is saying to the churches. It also says to him who overcomes, and that's repeated seven times. Individual Christians must overcome. Well, how do they overcome? 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says this, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'm going to go into that later. Revelation 1.9 starts, I, John, your brother, and the companion in suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The mother of James and John, who wrote Revelation, was one who was the one who asked uh, if her sons could sit on his left and right in glory. <laughs> you remember that? Jesus then taught them about humility and servant authority. He also indicated that they had prophesied their own uh, lives. As James was killed with a sword by, sword by Herod, and John was imprisoned and persecuted. John Gill says this. Irenaeus says, that John was banished to Patmos by Domitian, uh, emperor of Rome, as Arrhenius says at the later end of his reign, about the year 95 or 96. And as Tortillian says, after he had been cast into a vessel of flaming oil where he got no hurt, and his banishment was not for any immorality and capital sin he had committed, but for the word of God, for believing in Christ, the essential word of God, and for professing and bearing record of him, both in preaching and writing. So here is John in prison, not for a real crime, but for spreading the gospel. John has plenty of reason to be depressed and angry. But what do we see John doing? Next verse, verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. First of all, he was worshiping God on the Lord's day. By the way, that's Sunday, first day of the week. Not only that, but he was in close communion and relation with the Lord through the Spirit. And of course, that's worship. Next, an extraordinary thing happens. And this doesn't happen often, even in the Old Testament. But John is given a revelation directly from Jesus Christ himself. And some Bibles have the next verses in red and all the letters to the churches because they are direct 
words of Jesus. Revelation 111, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. This revelation scroll was sent to the seven churches. It was information they desperately needed to know and pass on to future generations. Revelation 1, 12 through 16, I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of crashing waters, rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining its, in all its brilliance. Whoa! What would your reaction be if you saw something like that? Well, John may not have even recognized Jesus. If he did, he was probably amazed at what he saw. He was so afraid and overwhelmed that he fell down as if he were dead. Revelation 117 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. In the King James, it says, he fell at his feet as though slain. Uh-oh, this is one of the main verses that people who do slain the spirit use to prove slain the spirit. <laughs> But as you can see from the context, there's nothing like slain in the spirit here. First, John fell of his own accord in obvious fear and worship, overwhelmed by his glory. No one touched him at all. Secondly, when Jesus does touch John, he says this, Revelation 1, 17a through 18. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. So what does he say? Don't be afraid. Get up. Write down what I tell you. You're not dead because I, Jesus Christ, conquered death by rising from the dead, and now I stand here with the keys of death. Of course, this is the exact opposite picture from what people are... <laughs> I don't know. Fooling people with, which is slain in the spirit, where people are put into trance states and encouraged to lay on the floor, writhing, screaming, moaning, crying, laughing, oinking like pigs, crowing like roosters, or mooing like cows. When you see something like that, you know it's demonic. That's exactly how the scripture uh, describes demon possession. When Jesus Christ really appears, it's for a purpose, not so we can lie on our backs. We as Christians have this promise that Jesus Christ has conquered death and his promises to us are true and faithful. Revelation 119, write therefore what you've seen, what is now, and what will take place later. We've already discussed that what is contained in the scroll is a record of what God has known and planned from eternity what was what was at the time of the seven churches and what will take place later. Everything that applies to the seven candlesticks applies to the church today. Revelation 120, the mystery of the seven char stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The seven stars that John saw in Christ's uh, hand represented the angels or overseers of the seven churches of, of Asia, and in them all the pastors and ministers of the church in all the periods of time until Christ's second coming. The ministers of the gospel mentioned here are not only compared to stars, but likewise to angels. And the meaning of the word for angels is actually messengers. As Christ sends forth ministers with the message of the gospel, and as the angels are Christ's ministering spirits, 
So are the preachers of the gospel, the ministers of Christ, the wait upon him and serve him in the ministry of the word to the church. The candlesticks represent the seven churches of Asia, and in them all the churches of Christ, also in successive ages to the end of time. The reasons why these are signified by candlesticks is that they are prophetic of the churches of Christ in several periods of time until he comes again. And it's because the whole book is a prophecy, a revelation of things that were shortly to come to pass, but would be strange and unsuitable to its title should the three first chapters contain nothing prophetic in them. I believe that the letters to all the churches contain valuable blessings and warnings, even for the church today. It's highly likely that someday when we see the whole picture, we will know that these letters were written, number one, to the real churches of that time. Number two, likely represent a prophetic picture of the church through history. And number three, are meant to be studied as a whole to glean what Christ meant for Christians and the church throughout the ages and especially the end of the age. The most critical point is number three. This is key to understanding the seven letters to in our context today. And that's why we're doing this study. The letters to the seven churches contain a roadmap that's particularly important today as we approach the end of the age. A few more points need to be made before we can go on. <clears throat> Revelation 2.7 says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. These two phrases are repeated seven times in the seven letters. Whenever something is repeated in the Bible, even twice, it's for added impact. It's like it's been underlined. But seven times? This is another key to understanding the seven letters. We must listen and comprehend what God says to the churches. What he is saying to the churches is not just for the churches, but for individual Christians. Again, to let him hear to the individual, to him who overcomes, to the individual. The message to the messages to the churches are not just for churches, but also for individual Christians. And we'll see that truth become even more evident as we go on. And that's the third key to the, uh, to the seven letters. Overcomes. You know, this is a concept not taught too much in Christianity today. Why? One of the reasons is Calvinism. This is a terrible mistake. The Bible is full of verses that not only shower all the blessings of salvation on those who continue in faith, believing, endure to the end, persevere, overcome, but also of dire warnings to those who fall away because they will be cut off, removed from the tree. You don't hear that taught too much, do you? If you doubt this, take a look ahead at the first letter. Revelations 2, 4 through 5. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstick from its place. Folks, I'm afraid that a lot of churches today don't have a lampstand. This is to a church. Jesus said, if you do not repent, I will take you out. He not only says this to churches, but also to individuals. They can be cut off because of the lack of continuing faith. Romans eleven nineteen. 19. You will say then bro branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant. But be afraid, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. 
I've been a, I was in a church once and a guy who got up who was a five point Calvinist and he was teaching through this section of Romans and he completely skipped over those verses. Couldn't even teach it. You know, this was to Gentile Christians. They can also fall away because of their lack of faith. And we know what it says in Hebrews 6. Uh-oh. Talks about people falling away. Dangerous. Remember, remember, remember even Jesus told the disciples they would fall away. And they certainly did. <laughs> They fortunately they repented and came back, but hey, it's dangerous for everyone. As long as God gives you life in this world, you can repent and return to Jesus. You can invite him into your life so he can he can feed you with the bread of life. He then must be allowed to be the Lord of your life. But there does come a time when the spirit stops driving with man. And that is if they fall away from the faith and they don't return, they don't repent. Repentance is key, folks. Second Peter 1.10, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fall. 1 Corinthians 10.12, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. <laughs> Calvinists can't even hardly utter the words fall away. <laughs> and yet Jesus himself talked about falling away. It's not a popular doctrine. But when you look at scripture, you find the profession Christians have to remain in faith. Or they too can fall away and lose what they had. And that's another subject. But I need to touch on it because it comes up often in the letters to the seven churches. Revelation 3.3, 3, remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Revelation 3.15 and 16, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. By the way, this is especially us, the Laodicean Church of the end times. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Whoa, we don't want to be spit out of his mouth. <clears throat> we need to be hot. The Bible is full of promises to those who believe, trust, and obey. Uh, the And dire warnings for those who do not believe, disobey without repentance, and continue in habitual sin. Unbelief is actually only one of the sins that can send a person to hell. And we know that from Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Oh, I've written an article on this before, and it's called And All Liars. We need to be very careful about lying. <clears throat> we must take the blessings and warnings from the lip of the lips of Jesus and the apostles. This is true grace teaching, not some easy believism. But always remember that we cannot be saved by works. Only by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Then balance that with the fact that we are we must overcome. It's repeated seven times. So how are we to overcome? Go back again to what we said at the start. I love this verse because there's a great song that goes along with it. First John 5, 4 through 5. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that it's overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Crucial. So this is the main key to understanding the seven letters to the churches. The old song goes, faith is a victory that overcomes the world. Faith is a part of the salvation process. We must believe 
But we cannot do that, uh, do what Jesus has done for us. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone. The grace is from and through Jesus Christ alone. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. Otherwise, we would not even know that we needed to repent. But then, once we do, we need to believe and have faith. And faith is an act of the will. Uh, here's another problem with Calvinism. They say that God uh, gave a gift of faith to people. It's a gift from God. They use the following verse as their proof text. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can vote, boast. So what is the gift that's being talked about here? It's actually grace. That's what they're zeroing in on. Some claim that this is saying that God gives us a gift of faith. Well, in that case, you don't even need to believe. God's already decided you're going to be a Christian. That's false Calvinistic teaching. In my opinion, that's not what this verse is saying. The verse addresses grace versus works. Not faith versus works. Another parallel passage in Romans confirms this as well. Remember, faith is not a work, but an act of the will. Believing in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens. Even if it's contrary to our understanding or beyond our understanding. Faith is believing in someone or something that is unseen. None of us has seen Jesus. Romans eleven six, But if by grace, and it's no longer by works, if it were grace, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. So we accept by faith the grace of Jesus Christ. Works then become the works of the spirit, not the sinful flesh. We know that faith without works is dead, but works can never replace grace. Works can never earn salvation. That's the point of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Not pitting faith against works. This is the only verse on which those who claim faith is a gift from God can actually hang their hat. However, there are many verses that talk about grace being a gift. Romans 5.15, but the gift is not like the trespass for if many died by the trespass of one man. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Romans 5, 17, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And Ephesians 3, 7, I became a servant of his gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Um, actually, when you look at Hebrews 12, 2, uh, they often try to use this verse as well. But it, it actually says, God is our faith's author or prince, leader, example, object, and the perfecter, finisher, uh, example of perfection, or awarder, uh, uh, awarder of the prize. In the NIV, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. KJV says, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews, looking into Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And Hebrews, uh, and uh, in the Weymouth, Weymouth uh, uh, translation, simply fixing our gaze upon Jesus, our prince leader in the faith, who also award us the prize. So there are different ways to translate that verse. And... Uh, we have to understand that that's not saying that faith is the gift that God gives us. Now, the Lord does help us with our faith. He puts us to the test. He brings testing into our lives to build up our faith. But the Bible also tells us we need to build our faith. So it's a two-way process. We have to co cooperate with the Lord in, in our faith. The NIV makes it sound like perhaps God has gifted us our faith. 
and does everything to bring it to perfection, leaving us with no responsibility. I don't think that verse in context is saying that. I believe the point of this passage is obviously steadfast faith, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who's the object of our faith and the one who will bring our faith to perfection and awards us the eternal prize if we continue to fix our eyes on him. This makes faith a two-way process, a cyclical process. As we trust God, he increases our faith so we can trust him more deeply and he can further increase and perfect our faith. If we do not fix our eyes on Christ, our faith will not increase and may shrink back. Ultimately, wandering from the faith, our faith can be destroyed. Hebrews 10, 38, but my righteous one will live by faith and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. 2 Timothy 2.18, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. By the way, believe it or not, there are a whole lot of people out there on the internet, hundreds and hundreds of websites that say that Jesus already came back. <laughs> Dangerous stuff. So that was written to Christians. God will strengthen and test the faith of anyone who believes in him. James 1.3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You know, he may even help us with our unbelief. Mark 9.21-24, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It, is often, it has often thrown him into the fi fire or water to kill him. He's talking about his son who was demon-possessed. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You know what? We can pray the same thing. Help me to believe. Yet there are many verses about the responsibility of Christians to build themselves up and stand firm in the face. Faith, let's, let's look at a few of those. Jude 120, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, etc. etc. 1 Peter 5 9, resist him standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And finally, Hebrews 4, 14, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Those he predestined and foreknew to be the elect, he will continue to help, and they will overcome by grace through faith in Christ. Those who once believed but did not overcome, losing their faith in, grace, in the grace of the person of Jesus Christ, will fall away and be eternally lost. Again, Hebrews 4, 6, 4 through 6, it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness and the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Luke uh, 8, 13. This is when Jesus talked about falling away. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. May we not be like that, folks. Because a time of testing, predicted long ago, is on its way right now. The Luke 8, 13 references a key thought. Christians have the word of God and the spirit to guide them, but they're not omniscient or omnipresent like God. 
They don't know the final outcome. Only God does. Their salvation, assurance in this life, comes from his promise to save those who believe in his grace through Jesus Christ. A person who calls himself a Christian must believe. Don't listen to these Calvinists who say you don't even need to believe to be saved. That's absolute heresy. Acts 16.31, they reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And of course, Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not only that, but the word believe in, is a, in the continuous tense in Greek in many places, meaning that we must keep, hold on, continue, persevere, and overcome in our faith. That's what true belief is. We must overcome with a faith that continues to trust in the true biblical Jesus Christ alone for our ultimate salvation. And I believe that overcoming faith is the main point of the letters to the seven churches. So I'm going to be pulling some 34 precepts out of these letters. I don't call them laws. We don't live under the law. But these are suggestions of how we can overcome through faith in the law of Christ, which is love and grace. However, these are precepts that Jesus Christ himself gave to the churches. So if we follow them, we're not going to lose our faith or be deceived or give up. Hallelujah. Thank you.